Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here amongst you. Um, I appreciate the invitation. Thank you for uh, reaching out. And it's an honor to present to the group. This is a group that I have been a member of for a very, very long time. You, uh, the chapter is really, really dear to my heart. Uh, despite the fact that since COVID, we all sort of began so we sat home and I haven't been involved anymore, but I'm hoping that this will be a beginning of a new journey for me too. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about myself and um, I will start sharing my is part of the slides that I am presenting. So let me know if all of you guys can see my slides and can hear me comfortably. And I'm hoping that the captionist can hear me good too. If you have any questions and there are pertinent, uh, please feel free to raise your hands. And um, I think Tim or Wendy are mending the chat um if the question is not very very hot and you can wait till the end of the presentation then we will uh, answer the question at the end a little bit about me uh i have both a master's degree in audiology and an aud um so when i started uh in my on my journey uh practicing with a master's degree but by the time that I started uh, doing all the research I came back so I took a mommy leave of absence uh, from 2004 uh, to I think it was 2006 five uh, for about a year to raise my son who was very colicky um when I came back I figured like you know what I need more information I need more research so that's when I went after my AUD and since between when I started and when my daughter was born and life interfered and it finally I AUD got finished in 2013 which it's hard to believe it's 10 years ago uh I have always been involved in audiology even when I was acting as a mommy uh I did a lot of medical legal research uh, I have been a bit a big advocate of for hearing loss. Either one, because now we live in the edge of technology and both of them have solutions. Uh, so I'm involved with Board of American Academy of Audiology and American Tinnitus Association. I have two practices, uh, Hearing Law Solutions and Auditory Processing Centers, which they are both uh, corporations registered in California. I have uh, represented a manufacturer by the name of the Synchro, which was a German company, the first neuromodulation therapy device for tinnitus, uh, which unfortunately went uh, bankrupt during COVID. Uh, so I have many, many years of clinical experience with tinnitus, as well as I have been a patient with tinnitus myself. Uh, tinnitus runs genetically in our family. My mom is the me, and then now my son who has it. Uh, but I gotta tell you, none of us are suffering from tinnitus because we all have learned and we all have been dealing with tinnitus and really it's not a bother to any one of us. Uh, in giving you disclosures, I currently serve on the executive board of American Tinnitus Association as the uh, assistant treasurer and I belong, uh, I take phone calls for tinnitus advisors program which I'm going to talk about. It's one of the proudest things that I do. It's because we take phone calls from everywhere in US, Canada, the world actually, for people who are in distress and they don't know what to do with their tinnitus. So ATA is a sponsoring this 10 app hotline, which I will give you. 
the information. So with all that, I think it's safe to start. If you guys are ready, I think we're eight minutes into it. Um, Wendy, do you want to wait or you, you guys want to start? I'm assuming we're good to go. Okay, so uh, one thing about tinnitus, I'm going to just give general information here. The, de the devices that we talk about, uh, all are technology. The success of the device depends on the patient and on the clinician. Uh, and you need to know that no two tinnitus patients are the same, the same way as no two hearing loss patients are the same. The uh, outcomes are highly, highly variable depending on the patient's, psych, uh, patient's presentations, the relationship between the hearing loss and the tinnitus, variation in perception of the tinnitus, variations in the reaction of the patient to tinnitus, and the variation in the pathophysiology of the tinnitus. Uh, so I want you to know that the information presented here are my personal opinion as a clinician has nothing to do with what ATA stands for. Okay, so I think one of the major questions is that why does it seem like there is no one trained in treatment of tinnitus? Uh, it's like you go to usually people's first choice is to go to their physician. And most often they hear that, hey, there is nothing to do with it, learn to live with it. And that statement is absolutely not true. Where does that statement come from? Unfortunately, is from lack of information uh, on the ENT side and the physician side, most of them are not interested in learning things that do not generate uh, income. So basically, tinnitus has become a, a category which is only interesting to those of us who are in love with it and have dedicated our lives to it. The other thing is that medicine, especially physicians, deal with things which are black or white. Either you have the disease or you don't have the disease. Either you need a surgery or you do not need the surgery. Uh, either your medication can work for you or the medication doesn't work. And tinnitus is not black and white. It's very, very gray. So it's that's one of the reasons. Tinnitus requires patient that uh, you only get it from a physician if you need surgery. Uh, ENTs in medical school only get possibly a lesson or two about tinnitus uh, because they, they, there's no surgery. So the surgeons usually do not even get any lessons about it. Hearing aid dispensers are not supposed to touch tinnitus cases, especially in the state of California. That's a area which American uh, Academy of Association stands for uh, very strongly because as you know, hearing aid dispensers, uh, yeah, some of them are very well educated, but some of them just have a high school degree and their certificate. So we basically, because tinnitus could be a sign of so many other medical disorders, we really don't want anyone who does not have an, a, a doctorate degree to touch it. Now, why not all audiologists know about it? Because audiology is growing. Of us can, the schools basically are trying to churn as many audiologists as possible. So not everybody is trained in tinnitus because simply there is no time. Despite the fact that now audiology has become a four year curriculum, uh, still, it's not enough time to work on everything. So most education about tinnitus is postgraduate and it's not a specific. So many of us who are who have dedicated our lives to tinnitus, we are pushing now for certification and special training. So if we want to talk about who can treat tinnitus, uh, I would tell you look for audiologists who have board certification with CHTM, 
which stands for Certificate Holder Tinnitus Management. That's basically the simplest way that an audiologist can tell you that I care enough about six month period learning about it. It doesn't guarantee that the person is abreast of all the information and knowledge coming out. It doesn't mean anything, but it's a beginning. So we're beginning to enforce this. So let's get into treatment of tinnitus. Um, uh, everybody who knows me that I like general categorizations because I think it gives us a way that we can process information more clearly. Uh, so one way to categorize tinnitus treatments is the ones which are aimed at directly reducing the intensity of tinnitus, what the patient perceives. And there are the ones which are aimed at relieving the annoyance which is associated with tinnitus. So, and in both of them, so when we talk about annoyance is how much tinnitus perceives It caps the person's life and their quality of life. When we talk about reducing the intensity, we're talking about reducing the loudness of the tinnitus. So uh, I'm going to break this down, but these are the two general categories. As you can see, there are devices which are going to be common between category one and category two, and those are medications. And some medications, basically, uh, these are some psych medications that we use in therapy now. And uh, basically, they are geared toward if the patient is not paying attention to the tinnitus, then it doesn't give the tinnitus an option to increase uh, volume. And then we have electrical devices, which I'm going to review with you right now. Then the other way to actually talk about different uh, treatment categories of psychological treatments, instruments that we use, and acoustic options, which basically we talk about all sort of sounds that we use in treatment of tinnitus. Uh, usually, if we want to talk about psychological, so I'm going to go through things separate, but if you want to talk about the psychological options, basically these are the options that the patient can work on her own behavior and the responses that she or he produces in perception of tinnitus. When we talk about instruments, we're talking about things which have uh, gained FDA uh, regulations in treatment of tinnitus. And then we talk about acoustic options are things which are available through musical therapy and used in treatment of tinnitus. So let's get into it. I have to get, as a scientist, I have to tell you, when you do research, uh, Cognitive behavior therapy, CBT, is one of the major uh, Im improvements in shows major improvement in life of a patient who is suffering from tinnitus. And it's because our uh, friends in psych have helped us deal with our patients because we don't have too many audiologists. Uh, so in, in recent years, there are not that many uh, psychologists who want to do CBT anymore, especially for tinnitus. So this is falling back on our uh, audiologists who are getting trained in CBT. So we have started using a modified version for uh, this because again, CBT belongs to psychologists. Uh, and it, this is like something that we I use in my practice as well because my sister is a psychologist who is trained in CBT. Uh, so if there is a CBT therapist that we work with, usually the audiologist is the lead and the CBT therapist is the one who works closely with us, helping us in management of the tinnitus. Then we have TRT, uh, which is tinnitus retraining therapy, progressive tinnitus management and tinnitus activities treatment, 
which out of three are basically based on behavioral modification, which is again, it's based on CBT. So let's talk about each one of this. Um, so this one just talks about two of my very dear friends who do CBT specifically, two psychologists, they have online programs, you can reach to them if you want. Let's get into tinnitus retraining therapy. TRT is the most widely used tinnitus therapy uh, in most practices. It's started by Professor Jastrobov and his wife. It talks about education and modification uh, in responses to tinnitus, which basically effectively causes habituations. Uh, when we talk about the Jastrobovs, it's a neurophysiological model, which the, it's a husband and wife team. They have worked and they have done research. They have dedicated their life in, to TRT. And most people like me, we use a TRT not in a traditional concept, rather in some form shape that would benefit the patient. Uh, so basically, TRT is about education of the patient, bringing light into disassociation of the negative emotion, decreasing the emotional negativity towards tinnitus, and increasing the emphasis on relaxation and pleasure centers of the brain. We basically encourage habituation. Uh, in CRT, we usually use uh, some sort of relaxation therapy in addition to uh, sound maskers in order to be able to help the patient to transition. Uh, CRT, uh, you got to make sure whoever is telling you that they know what to do, they actually are trained and they have a signature certification by doctors, both Dr. Jastrobovs. Uh, so do not suffice because we know that there are people out there who just say, oh, I'm trained in TRT. I would say if you go somewhere, most of us who are trained in TRT, we have our certifications actually on the wall. Progressive tinnitus management is another behavioral modification towards tinnitus. Uh, this is by James Henry, who is a dear friend and basically it's management of reactions to tinnitus. PTM is a work, uh, it's used in VA method uh, for therapy. Uh, VA is a strong, uh, Dr. Jastrobov, uh, Dr. J Dr. James Henry basically, and Jastrobov have worked very closely with each other in the beginning in development of this. Basically it's again, based on the same neurophysiological model detangling tinnitus from the negativity associated with it. Dr. Henry has dedicated his life uh, to VA. Pretty much that's a setting that he has always been in and he has been very, very successful with treatment of it. PTM has the stages. Usually the patients start from the lower stage, which is uh, a consultation, and then it moves all the way to the fifth stage which basically they work directly with a psychologist uh, in uh, treatment of negativity and what affects their quality of life negatively about tinnitus perception. Usually in this model, there is on the level of first and second, audiologists get involved in order to make sure there is, uh, what is the degree of hearing loss, uh, and what is the relationship of the tinnitus loudness to the hearing loss? Tinnitus activities treatment, which is for sure, we all call it TAT. Again, it's another behavioral modification, but this one has a specific scenarios. Basically, patients are given homeworks and and they come up with the specific problems that they have with their tinnitus perception. Uh, TAT, actually, it's wonderful. They offer a lot of sessions online, group sessions. Uh, and if anybody is interested in this, please reach out to my office and we'll give you details. 
um, um, they actually have once a year from University of Idaho uh, sessions that everybody can join. Audiologists, sufferers, everybody joins. And basically we talk about treatment, patients talk about uh, the newest things that they have tried and a lot of scientists actually present in this group. Um, so if you guys are interested, please let me know and we'll put you in touch with this group. Then there is an aromod of gelation therapy. So this development in tinnitus that we are using currently in most practices. Uh, neuromodulation basically means, sort of if you want to put it in layman's term, it's uh, deep massaging the brain in a way that we cause uh, more, we help the, help the brain to have more stimulations in order to let go of one overactive location in the brain, which is the tinnitus perception. So by causing the other areas of the brain, uh, stimulating the other areas of the brain, we basically tell the brain, don't pay attention to this. And then whatever overactivity we have here, we try to decrease it in, uh, decrease it by opening up other locations. So the way that we talk about neuromodulation usually is by saying, because of the tinnitus perception, we're opening outlets from the other areas so the tinnitus can basically, we can release the traffic jam. So the neuromodulation works with the concept of neural plasticity, which means taking advantage of teaching the brain what to do and uh, how to get out of the problem that it has. Uh, again, neuroplasticity, when you hear this word, basically means the brain can still learn. We use neuroplasticity in dealing with traumatic brain injury patients, stroke patients. Uh, so it's we know that it's effective. Um, Dinkra basically was the first device which worked with neuromodulation and it came into USA. Uh, and then basically linear now it's working with neuromodulation. Any person or any clinic, clinical uh, doctor who works with any neuromodulation device, we need to make sure that they are trained in it. Again, there are certifications requested in this. Uh, Linear has its own certification, which means the provider needs to be trained in it. They are not just letting anybody who does not know about tinnitus jump on their bandwagon, which I it's an amazing thing. Uh, which means it cannot be mistreated. And basically neuromodulation means we use sound and other stimulations in order to uh, stimulate other areas of the brain. We use musical tones, harmonics, and different pitches in addition to different senses which get involved in therapy. So the first form of neuromodulation, since the synchro doesn't exist anymore, I, and the latest, which is getting a lot of attention and a lot of success, is done by a company, Neuromod, which is off of Dublin, Ireland, and the device is known as Linear. Uh, Linear is uh, just got their FDA approval this year, and they have been rolling out, but Neuromod has been basically setting up their infrastructure for the past, I would say, five years. A lot of research has gone into it, a lot of development, a lot of infrastructure. It's one of the best tinnitus therapy companies that I have worked with. I've had the pleasure of representing them, working with them. Um, the device shows a lot of success. Uh, it's a multi-sensory, that's why we call it a bimodal. It's a neuromodulation stimulation. It has a tongue tip, uh, which basically with 32 electrodes. Uh, basically, I'm gonna, I have pictures of it, which you guys can see. So this is the tongue piece. 
and then it has a headphone associated with it. Uh, so again, I need everybody to make sure there is another company which has come up with the same headphone technology and it is claiming that their device is as successful as Neuromod. So please don't fall for that. Make sure you go to certified people. So the tiny piece basically works in unison with, not unison, but in accordance with the Bluetooth headphone. Uh, the tongue piece has electrical stimulation, which would deliver on the surface of the tongue and it goes through the trigeminal nerve. And the headphones has tonal presentation, which means sound. to the auditory cortex. So as you can see, we are it's a first of its kind, which is using the neural stimulation, uh, the electrical stimulation of the trigeminal nerve on the tongue in addition to what the sound is being delivered to the brain. So we are directly stimulating the brain in two different locations, which we are encouraging the brain to let go of the tinnitus again by all by decreasing the overactivity. This and this is very simply put, and I apologize, I don't want to get into the scientific ways of how it works, uh, but it is successful very much by I would say 80 to the point that 83, and I think it now it's at 85% of people who are using Neuromod uh, linear that they are recommending it to somebody else to use. Basically, right now, uh, Neuromod uh, and phase two. Phase one clinicians basically are uh, are there. So they, they didn't come and roll it out to everybody right away because obviously they wanted to make sure that what the research has been done in their live in their library and scientific advisory can be replicated but when they roll out cl clinics and then once that got uh, evaluated basically then we went to the second uh, group of clinicians which are involved so neuromod uh, basically linear.com if you guys go to go uh, on uh, the chat i released it so by putting the name linear uh, tinnitus therapy, you are going to find all providers which are available in USA right now. Uh, so they rolled out as always, getting the CE approval is much easier than getting the FDA approval, especially approval that they got from FDA is one of a kind. It's not only the one that it says they are safe to use rather than they actually have delivered results from what they use. Uh, the next device where it's called Levo system. Um, so this, the Levo system, basically the science was done and the initial seed funds came from uh, Siddhar Sinai Medical Group. Uh, but then during COVID, they went bankrupt. So it was auto harmonics. They went bankrupt. They bought out by a Canadian company. And now they are back on the market with the same technology. Uh, one, if I have to criticize them for one thing, is that there hasn't been any changes to what from the time that they got introduced in the market, I think seven, five. They are using the same technology, same sounds, same everything. It hasn't been any updates to it. Uh, but the device works for a specific patients. So we do use it in therapy. I do use it for my patients. It's a form of acoustic therapy. Uh, so what it does is basically we match the patient's tinnitus. We have the patient to listen to their own tinnitus. So we bring tinnitus from subconscious to conscious, actively having the patient deal with the tinnitus by having the patient listen to their own tinnitus. Uh, if I have to tell you, uh, it, again, the device works, but we need to choose the patients very, very uh, diligently. 
Um, basically, the way that liver works, it is used at night only. Uh, so the patient during the day can use their hearing aids um, or not use anything because we can use it with patients who do not have any hearing loss. Uh, linear is the same. We can use it with patients who do not have hearing loss. We can, uh, again, it's a form of acoustic therapy. Uh, the device shows that it proves the results. Uh, how much results, we still don't know. There is no uh, result coming out or published yet. Um, the next one, so actually, let me just show you how it looks like. So they got their FDA clearance. So there is a difference between clearance and approval. Clearance means it's safe to use uh, pretty much. So their clearance is about uh, is for people 18 and above. Linear is the same thing. Uh, it requires an initial programming. So it's a, basically an iPod with uh, wired headphones. And this has a software which on the iPod basically presents the tone to the patient. There is initial programming of the device, just like linear. And for follow-up programming management is needed, just like linear. Uh, VA has approved uh, this device uh, for treatment. Uh, again, I have to say that one thing about every device, they have advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantages about this device is, I believe it has a restocking fee, uh, or last I checked has a restocking fee, which it um, varies uh but from clinician to clinician and at the time that i uh was accepting returns on a wing they is just we had to show proof that the patient tried and the device did not work uh so uh it's not something that you can jump on it so the same thing is with linear. I have to tell you, uh, returns are not on these devices because they basically has so much gone into development of the device. The returns are not something which is easy to do. Duality is the new one coming into market. Uh, they got their C clearance. So CE is equivalent to FDA, uh, but Europe. So Duarity is uh, basically their, has named their device Tinerity G1, and Duarity is the name of the mother company. Uh, they actually are another device. Again, they are brand new. They just started marketing. They are just entering. If they have a clearance, I believe in June or July of this year. Uh, I believe Linear got it in January or February. So basically, uh, they are coming up. They don't have a great marketing plan yet, but they are just starting in a few clinics. Um, so the advantage, it's a bone conduction that can be used day and night. It's a broadband tinnitus sound, basically a sound generator. Uh, it has an adhesive adapter, which is used behind the ear on the mastoid. This is exactly where you see this person putting it. Uh, because it's a bone conduction, it leaves the ear canal open and it actually can stimulate both sides at the same time. Uh, but So it's a great device, I have to tell you. I have been actually renders a lot of results to patients who are suffering from a specific tonal tinnitus. Um, so the sound that it generates, it's a broadband sound. And I have to tell you, one of the best part of this device, it's the most affordable on the market right now. It's a rechargeable, uh, but uh, you have everybody who uses it has to buy, continue to buy the adapter pack, which is the stickers, which we use in order to put it, stick it to the head, to the mastoid bone. 
Uh, so I really, really think that this device has a lot of potential. Uh, and the most potential is because of its affordability and because of the fact that it can be used night or day and because it's used in taking advantage of the bone conduction. Okay, so the newest one, which... And it's coming up, it's laser light therapy devices. They use usually the low frequency presentation of laser light. Uh, laser light has been used with great success in other areas of medicine, hair restoration, pain management, uh, a lot of orthopedics. So after orthopedic surgeries, they actually use for stimulation of bone growth. Uh, our friends in, uh, uh, I would say, beauty industry uh, have been using it for uh, face treatment, facial treatment. So it shows the results. And it's the most important part is that it's pain free. <laughs> it doesn't cause any pain. And right now, we do not have a solid protocol in it yet, uh, uh, but it is showing results. Uh, usually, uh, right, I would best for laser light therapy, but there are ones who exist. Um, one thing about laser light therapy is you have to either buy a package or per session treatment, again, because it's something as you go. And the negative thing about it is that we do not have a solid protocol. All right, the other things that work about tinnitus, hearing aids that you all know, uh, hearing aids are not as a therapy for tinnitus, rather because we are helping the patient hear better, we decrease tinnitus perception. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about hearing aids because I'm assuming everybody here is very well versed in use of hearing aids. Uh, let's talk about acoustic or sound therapies that we used. So some of the sound therapies that we use, uh, there are companies involved with this, which are very, very successful. There are ones which are basically on them. So there are some of them who were, who are more controlled and there are ones which are basically available on online and you can use. I would say the best ones that I usually recommend to my patients are the sound of nature. Uh, the ones that have implemented some sort of nature sounds uh, are very much more successful because we are, again, go back to cavemen, we all still have a lizard brain and usually that lizard brain is the part that is effective trying to fight tinnitus perception. And the nature sounds are the sounds that uh, we, we have it innate in us as relaxing sounds. I hardly find people who hate listening to ocean waves or rain. Uh, so I would say if you try to use that, we usually see more results. Um, there I specifically, as a clinician, I do not like notch therapy. I find that in my patients with that uh, previously, they have used notch therapy. Basically, they are overworking that area uh, that is causing the tinnitus perception, both in cochlea and relation to it into auditory cortex. Uh, that we are overworking the area rather than underworking it and giving it a relaxation. So personally, I do not like that, but it's an available format. Uh, so one of the best acoustic sound therapy ones that I have worked with, it's a company called Sound Pillow. Uh, Scott is the owner of that company and he's a veteran. And I think his device is one of the best devices that I have worked with, especially because he offers a lot of customer service to his device. It's not something that you buy. And if anything goes wrong, you don't know what to do with it. So there are tinnitus maskers, uh, which is available. Tinnitus maskers, basically, I personally call them Band-Aid relief because they are not tinnitus therapy options. Rather, they are distraction techniques. 
uh, there are ways that we actually tell the brain, don't listen to the tinnitus, instead pay attention to the sound. Basically, uh, what we use them, they are general sounds that we use usually. And one, a couple of researchers came out that it says people who use general maskers, let us say people who sleep with white band noise during night, are aging their brain a little bit faster than expected. So it's something to think of right now. Uh, again, I do not encourage maskers because they are not a therapy. Then there are alternative treatments, which I strongly recommend. And most of the alternative treatments are based on increasing the blood flow to cochlea or decreasing inflammation in the body or changing the chemistry of the body. Uh, because we know chemistry of the body actually has an effect on tinnitus perception. This is how we control, try to control the tinnitus through uh, medication or through food that the patient is taking. Uh, the concept of all these all alternative therapies is basically treatment of underlying factors or causations to the tinnitus. So most of the time, if we work with somebody who, like a patient who comes, the audiology, the, the audiologist chooses to work with the person, we see fast results. Some examples of all these alternative therapies are uh, craniosacral your facial treatment point trigger point therapies, biofeedback, neurofeedback, pulse electromagnetic, which is PMF, TMJ uh, management actually helps with that too. Uh, so these are the ones which we encourage the patients to use while they are under uh, care of an audiologist who's a tinnitus specialist. Uh, they usually render results much faster when we can actually control and work in unison with therapists who offer all these. So in order to tell you uh, what are the things to do, uh, if you guys want to help in development of more tinnitus therapy devices, like the one that Susan Shore is talking about, I would say you need to start talking about tinnitus. You need to not only complain, rather than heavily get involved in education, educating people that they don't have to suffer from tinnitus. To continue raising awareness that tinnitus has a treatment. And one of the major factors is ATA. We figured as a board that there are areas and there are people who do not know what to do with their tinnitus. And that is what is taking them to the point that uh, unfortunately they commit suicide. So we came up with this tinnitus advisor program, which is an 800 number that the patient can leave a message. And we have advisors who are all tinnitus certified providers. We take the calls. We take the call and we usually offer a 15 minute consultation for free. We, in that, usually it never takes 15 minutes. I will tell you, I have been on the call with a patient that sometimes for an hour, uh, but usually we can wrap it up within 30 minutes if the patient doesn't have any other adverse reaction or they are not overacting. Uh, and we are very, very proud of it. So please share this with people that you know, because again, we do not want to lose people to tinnitus. There is hope and there are things to be done. As you see, the research is coming up. The newest research, we are, the newest device, which we are hoping that comes up is Susan Shore's device. Uh, again, my office is available to anybody who wants to ask any questions. I would prefer that the questions go to my administration. Uh, you have my website. Again, I am proud to be a part of this group and I am proud to tell you that there is hope in tinnitus perception.